Hello and welcome to the one analytical program I enjoy and learn more from than perhaps any other show that I do. And I hope you do too. This is of course our annual start of the year forecast show with Ruchir Sharma, in which we look ahead at what to expect in 2017. Ruchir has had, if I may say so Ruchir, an amazing last 12 months analyzing and forecasting global trends. And of course, with his book, which was a blockbuster, The Rise and Fall of Nations. Nations. <laughs> Correct. Just one example I'll give you this, and this will embarrass Ruchir, which I love doing, who has no idea that I was going to bring this up. Uh, it's just a small example of a day in the life of Mr. Sharma. Ruchir recently gave a lecture at the London School of Economics. And guess what? That lecture became the most downloaded LSE lecture of the entire year of 2016. And there are a lot of great people who lecture at LSE. Well done for once in your <laughs> life, Ruchir. Today, Ruchir is going to make forecasts on a huge range, or at least 10 topics, uh, from the impact, for example, that Trump, or what he calls the Trump bump, will have on India and the world, to what direction the Indian economy will take this year. Should it be Make It India? Should it be Make For India? And why? To the earthquake that's hitting outsourcing and the tech space in a bit of trouble. We will ask him uh, where to invest our savings globally and then do the opposite of what he says. No, do what he says. And his suggestion, by the way, on this, where to invest globally your savings is a surprise. Also coming up, a uh, global time bomb that is ticking this at this very minute. So lots and lots to get through. So let's start right away. But first of all, Ruchir, you're going to talk about Trump. The general feeling all of us have this huge depression, or there should be huge depression in the United States about Trump. There isn't. No, absolutely not. In fact, I think that this has been one of the most dramatic uh, starts to a, to a presidency. I mean, it hasn't quite started, but in terms of the sentiment effect that we have seen of it after he got elected. Uh, because if you look at the rally which is taking place in the U.S. stock market, but more than that, if you look at the consumer and business confidence in D.C.s in the U.S. today... Here it is. Here's your graph. Just have a look at that. This is the Trump bump that you're talking about. Yeah. Consumer confidence is the highest in two decades after Mr. Trump has taken over. Look at that. It's just shot up. Uh, after he won. Yeah, that's right. And it's consumer confidence, business confidence. So I think that this has been the dramatic reversal, which is that before he was uh, elected, there was a lot of fear about what exactly Trump would bring to the presidency. But at least from a financial market, business economy. and economic standpoint, yeah. there's a lot of optimism out here. This is almost bordering on euphoria. In fact, some of the business leaders in the United States now are really saying that this is possibly the most business-friendly president that America has seen in recent times. No, this is not very well known in India, <laughs> which is looked down at the Trump uh, victory as like what happened to America. But anyway, let's have a look at one of the things that have made uh, the Trump bump and everybody optimistic. And it's, it's a shocking thing that he's promised. He has promised a tax revolution. Just look at this. The current corporate tax in America is about 35%. Trump is saying he's going to get it down to 15%. Is that, is it, is it, can he really, will he do that? You know, like he's made lots of promises mm -hmm. uh, before the campaign. I think th uh, that this is one promise which is likely to come through. Uh, there's other stuff which, uh, right. which you know, uh, <laughs> maybe twisted out of shape in terms of what comes through. But this is likely to come through. And yeah, I think this has very significant implications for the world and for India as well. So I think that, uh, that yes, you're right, that a reason why there's so much optimism in America today has to do with the fact that he's promising major tax cuts and major deregulation. American productivity over the last few years has been very low at barely half a percent or so. Now, uh, he's really promising that he's going to lead, uh, that his measures are going to lead to a major increase in American productivity over the next few years. Right. Whether that happens or not, I don't know as yet, but I think that he's trying to basically go down the same path as Reagan, which is tax cuts, deregulation, and try to get America back to growing at the 3 to 4 percent rate is what he talks about. So he says he's going to go back to the 3.5% average rate during the Reagan years. Can right. he do that? 
Well, I don't really think so because I think there are two factors to economic growth. One is productivity and the other is the increase in the labor force, the number of people right. coming to work. Right. The productivity, you can still try and do something with by tax cuts and deregulation. Right. So he but may get the productivity at the level of Reagan, which was about 1.7% growth. Yes. But? But on the other side of the equation, for him to sort of change the labor force dynamics is going to be impossible. So therefore, I feel that even though it's going to be on a trained basis over the next few years, it's going to be very difficult for America to grow much faster than it is currently growing of about 2%. But still, I feel that this so, optimism for a while at least right. could translate into more animal spirits and a bump in growth. So you're saying that in Reagan, the 3 point whatever 5% was 1.7% productivity increase and about the same amount, 1.7 in labor population in, or labor force increase. Yes. Now the labor force, instead of 1.7% growing every year, is growing at? Barely half a percent. Barely so, half exactly. a percent. So, so 1.7 plus 0.3 is 2%. So yeah. even if he managed productivity and does everything, there is underlying stagnation in the population growth rate, which will never let him hit 3.5%. Yes, and I think this is a global point, which I think is really underappreciated, that the global economy grew very rapidly between 1950 until the global financial crisis of 2008, because the global economy had never seen such an explosion in its population growth rate. Right. That peaked in the middle of last decade and has been falling off a cliff uh, since then, or at least the working age population right. growth has peaked. Working age, yeah. Yes, uh, which is what really matters right. for economic exactly. growth. <clears throat> so I think that that is something which is underappreciated everywhere. In China, it's negative now, the working age population growth. In the United States, this is what's going on. Actually, it's a very yeah. good point. I mean, growth is productivity and your population people. growth. Productivity, yeah. person, and number of people. Yes. And if one's going slowly, you can't really achieve yes. the high spots on others. But coming back to this drop in the uh, corporate tax rate. tax rate from 35 to 15%, how uh, that kind of promise, how will India respond? Just have a look at where India stands. In fact, how will the world respond? Because if the biggest economy in the world suddenly cuts its tax rates, everybody's going to go there and you're going to forget the rest of the world. So you have to react. Let's have a look at what tax rates around the world looks like, let's take some countries. US current is under 40%, Germany is around 30%, Korea is around 25%, Eastern Europe about 20%. And they want, America, he's going, Trump wants to cut US rates to 15, that's lower than all these countries. That's right. What a huge change that's going to make. Yeah, I think that you know, some of his tax proposals are very significant and I think could be a major game changer as far as countries like India are concerned. Because countries like India have historically done well uh, by attracting a lot of uh, foreign investment or at least yes. using that to, uh, to sort of aid growth. But if you, the world's largest economy is going to have a tax rate so low, that is a major game changer. So I think that... Um, uh, about the Trump presidency, what's becoming increasingly clear is that tax policy is going to be used as almost some form of protectionism, which is that about how to keep jobs in America, how to increase production in America further, the tax policy is going to be used a lot. how to make America more attractive for business, right? Yes. But that, uh, that means it may, if America is more attractive, it's a bit of a worry for India. How will India react? Should India lower its rates too? Because otherwise... Who's going to come here? I think that's absolutely critical, which is that, the, uh, that uh, we are likely to, to, like, to see a race to the bottom on tax rates. Wow. And India's corporate tax rate is one of the highest in the world, especially compared to the um, East Asian countries and other manufacturing uh, yeah. hubs in the world. India has a pretty high tax rate, Eastern Europe or yes. East Asia. So it is going to be absolutely critical for India to lower its corporate tax rate if it wants to compete in the global marketplace. And there's a, second, uh, there's a second tax proposal which is even more dangerous as far as India is concerned. The first one is pretty straightforward, which is America cuts back its corporate tax rate. India needs to try and respond to that to remain competitive. The second tax proposal is even more dangerous, which is he's speaking about something called a destination tax, which is really that, you, uh, that depending on where you produce the good, you'll be taxed accordingly. So to put it very crudely, that would mean that if something is produced in America, it will not uh, be taxed tax. or very low taxes. And if something is produced abroad and imported into America, the taxes are going to be much higher. Wow. So yeah. that destination tax proposal is gaining a lot of play in America. 
The probability that gets passed is not as high as a corporate tax rate cut, but it is likely to do. And I think this has very major implications to the other point we're going to speak about, that we are in an era of deglobalization. Right. And along with these changes in U.S. tax policy, this entire model that India and other emerging markets have relied on, on exporting your way to prosperity, I think that model is in serious right. danger because of these proposals. Talking about the tax, a bit of good news for us. There's pressure on our politicians to lower corporate tax rates, which yeah. should boost the Indian economy. Although there are political risks to it, people say you're pro-rich and you're not thinking about the poor, etc. But uh, India just, this is going to put a lot of pressure to reduce taxes in India in this budget, if not this one, the next one. No, I think it has to be this budget because yeah. you can't Too be late. reactive to this, yeah. right? Because in terms of the fact is that India's corporate tax rate is very high. Right. And although there's a game plan to reduce it gradually over the next three to four years, but the rate is still very high. And especially in this change environment, we have to react to it. So I, th so I think that we have to look, they almost take it for granted that America's corporate tax rate is coming down significantly, whether it's in 15 in one shot or it's over a period of time, is the only detail which has to be worked out. And if the destination tax also comes through, that, that really puts the pressure even more. Right. I mean, in the old days, we used to be a protectionist country and we used to have high tariffs and favor uh, manufacturing in India. And the Americans used to say, oh, you protectionist, socialist, uh, obsolete guys. They're beginning to sound like old India. Yeah, it's a bit like They're the becoming... Bombay Club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. If you really sort the of Bombay look Club. at it. In Trump terms of and the it, Bombay Club. Yeah, right. I mean, there's lots of echoes of that. Yes. But having said that, I think like there's still the significant part I really find is this burst of optimism taking place among American businesses and American consumers on the back of his presidency. I think that we really, I mean, his, uh, his victory was unanticipated, but the fact that there'd be such a positive reaction to that is completely I confounding. I hate to say it, but I always suspected that you and I move in totally different circles. Everybody I know is in, there's a burst of pessimism after he's, uh, the tr Trump has won. But anyway, going on to your second trend this era of deglobalization. Let's have a look at what Ruchir is talking about. Deglobalization is a complete change from earlier where globalization, trade, was uh, the done thing in the world. Now, world trade is falling, number one. Number two, global capital flows, which India depends on so much, plunging. Nobody is sending their capital outside America and to other countries. And thirdly, a flow of migrants are also slowing down. So, Ruchi, let's have a look at that first. Uh, so, when you have these three, I'm going to ask you this question. Is outsourcing, which is so important for India, dead or dying, or is it really under severe strain? Have a look at uh, what Ruchi says about world trade falling. Uh, let's have a look at that first global trend. This is what it looks like. Now, trade as a percentage of GDP used to be 60% globally. 60% of world GDP was in trade. Now it's dropped by 13% to 47 And that is a huge drop. That's billions and billions of dollars. And that is going to have a huge impact. The world is basically becoming more inward-looking. The second part of this uh, aspect of deglobalization, which Richard talks about, is this global capital flow sponging. Look at that. In 2007, it was 16% of GDP, global GDP. Now it's 2%, Ruchir. I mean, that kind of a change is an earthquake. Yeah. So I think, you know, like, it, it shows up that last decade, our foreign exchange reserves were uh, going up very significantly. Uh, this decade, that's not happening. And India here has done relatively well on the foreign direct investment front. But we, you know, what, what we tend to forget is that foreign direct investment is a very small share of cross-border capital flows. It's really banks which lend a lot across borders. It's, a, it's also foreign portfolio flows. Those flows have, have slowed down significantly, particularly cross-border bank lending. So banks in Western Europe, in America, are much more reluctant now to lend across their borders in the post-crisis world. So a major change as far as capital flows is concerned. Just two impacts on that on India. One, a deglobalization in terms of trade is going to affect our companies that export a lot. Yes. 
And number two, the drop in flow, uh, capital flows is going to affect the stock market quite a lot. You're not going to get a buoyant stock market with foreign investments, um, capital flows coming in, right? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, yeah. but as I said, that the major impact of this is not so much even in terms of FII flows or FDI flows, right. it's about bank flows. Okay. Which is that how much capital do foreign banks deploy into countries like India? Right. And that number has really been shrinking a lot. So I think that there's just less money available. And the other significant implication of this is that a countries like India really cannot run <coughs> current account deficits anymore. Our current account deficit now is quite manageable. It's, uh, yes. We barely run a current account deficit of just a 1% of GDP or so, I think. Right. But it just means that in this new deglobalized world, mm. running current account deficits and funding it through capital flows, that model, uh, that model now is uh, passe. Right, right. And, and that something has to be done to correct that. Uh, and the third deglobalization you talk about is also does affect India and, and of course all emerging markets is the slow in the growth rate of migration. Ma migrants going to from the poorer countries to the richer countries or developing to the uh, emerging markets to the developed world. Let's have a look at what that looks like. Uh, here it is. In 2006, an average in those years was nearly 20 million people. Now it's right down to about 12, 13 million people. That means yeah. a drop of nearly 30 percent. Yeah, from the peak. From so the peak. I, yeah, because yes. I think that the environment has become much more hostile or at least less friendly uh, for immigrants being welcome yes. into Western societies. Right. And I don't see that changing. In fact, that's, that's, that's going to likely deteriorate further in the months and years ahead. So, so, so that's my point. There are three classic uh, tenets of globalization, trade, capital, and immigration. All three are now in retreat. In and retreat, I think that, yeah. that, that these trends tend to be enduring in nature because these are societal trends, these are sociological trends. And so I think that the, these trends are likely to last and we have to change our entire model in terms of what to expect. And so therefore, the earlier point that you were making, I think in this environment, the entire business of outsourcing is going to be seriously threatened. Now, nothing's going to disappear overnight, right. but any growth from outsourcing uh, in this environment is going to be very difficult. Similarly, the classic I emerging think market model... just announced tough times ahead kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. So I think that, uh, that there are different reasons for it as well, but deglobalization really means that the world is getting more uh, protectionist and it's going to be difficult for you to export your way to prosperity like many countries from Korea to China did um, over the last few decades. But Richard, normally when we do these, we make these forecasts, but these first two forecasts, and there are more to come, are really much bigger changes required and bigger impacts in the economy, like tax rates coming down to 15%, deglobalization, uh, people unable to emigrate abroad, uh, outsourcing being hit. These are huge. People have to change their models India has to change its model of functioning now. Yeah, but that's, you know, uh, in terms of we've seen these cycles before uh, and we just, got, we just get so used to what was happening in the last two or three decades. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is the kind of world which used to exist before that. And we're getting into a world which is uh, less integrated so compared to, to what it used agile, to be. agile, though, to yeah. understand these and change. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's right. Okay, and now your third trend. We've been talking in India about a 7% growth rate and, you know, it's, it is a, a wonderful feeling, although as you and many others have pointed out, the data is not 100% um, kosher. Yes. However, let's say it is 7%. Even that 7%, even with the new data, is going to be tougher than ever before this year to achieve. And you're not talking about uh, demonetization. You're <laughs> talking about many other factors. Yes. Uh, we are post-demonetization, right. been there, done that. So you say that the it's 7% uh, growth is harder to achieve than ever before in 2017. Why? Let's have a look at the number of countries at the moment and earlier that are growing above 7%. In the four or five years between 2003 and 2007, 50 countries grew above 7% of year. GDP a year. In 2008 to 2015, 25 countries around the world grew a, a, a GDP of above 7% a year. And now, 2016, only six countries are growing above 7%? Yeah, so, you know, this is what really tells you about... And this, sorry, out of 188 countries? Yes, taken? that's right. Okay. So this is, this is 
about how much the global economy has changed in the post-crisis world. There is not a single region or single major country I know which is growing at the same pace as it was before 2008. So the baseline for economic success has to change everywhere. And I think that this is where we don't quite adjust our own expectations, which is that we still sort of keep looking at the reference point of the last decade when the global economy was booming and we grew at 8 to 9% on how to get back to 8 to 9% kind of economic growth. Well, what we have to understand is that growing at 8 to 9% in this world where the global economy is barely growing at 2.5%, maybe 3% on the upside, in that environment for any country to grow at a rate of more than 7%, is going to be extremely difficult because the, the six countries, if you look at the list of the six countries, many of those are countries like, I think there are countries like Iraq on that list, Ivory Coast, some of these countries which Tanzania. are really Tanzania or uh, uh, Myanmar, you know, like right, very Myanmar small, is, yeah. new, uh, newly opening from economies. From a small base, yeah. I mean, from yeah. a much smaller base, which are just about mm. sort of growing very rapidly. So to be in that mix is going to be extremely difficult. The only other country in Asia which comes close to growing at 7% these days is the Philippines. But the game has become that much more difficult. So I think that this is also something for us. It's very difficult for us to uh, quite internalize this. But the fact that if we can't achieve more than 7% growth, we should not sort of kill ourselves too much. Understanding that the yeah. global economy is now growing at a much slower pace than it was for the factors we have just spoken about, which has to do with the population growth rate trends and also some of the other factors we'll speak about going forward from deglobalization.